Episode 6. We thought we hit rock bottom, but much like a Winterfell pool, there may not be a bottom. But in this episode, we find out that Loras' birthmark plays a vital role. So we start out at the House of Boar and Tedious, where, once again, nothing is happening. Let's keep in mind that the last time on Game of Thrones and the intro takes 4 minutes and 35 seconds. We then watch Arya wash bodies for a full 2 minutes. She then bickers with this girl and listens to her lie for another 2 minutes. She then bickers with Kindly Hagar and gives some exposition about her background for another 2 minutes, as if we haven't already seen the other episodes of Game of Thrones. For God's sake, do something with Arya! Do something with her! Have her collect information around Bravos. Have her observe assassinations. Have her warg into Nymeria. Anything. I'd rather watch her win the King's Moot with Nimble Dick and Strong Bellwas than to watch her sweep anymore. Meanwhile, in this primo vacation spot outside of Valyria, Jorah and Tyrion are also giving useless exposition. Yes, Tyrion and Jorah's dads are both dead. We saw those episodes. Meanwhile, often, oh no, we're back with Arya again? Damn it! So after watching Arya wash the floor for 30 seconds, we get this weird euthanasia scene. Arya convinces this girl that the waters at the House of Black and White will heal her. And I call bullshit. The House of Black and White has a huge temple in the middle of Bravos. Everyone should know what it's about. It's just not realistic for Arya, a foreigner, to be instructing a local in the ways of the many-faced god. I mean, imagine if I went to Iran and started telling them about Shia Islam, or I went to Japan and started telling them about Shintoism. So after more washing and some walking, we finally get to something new, 18 minutes into the episode. Because Arya is able to trick a little girl into committing suicide, she is now ready for a face. Incidentally, tricking little kids into believing things is one of the easiest things in the world. My five-year-old nephew believes the Avengers are real people. Meanwhile, Tyrion and Jorah are having a romantic walk when all of a sudden, they're captured and turned into slaves. If I had a nickel for every time that happened, Tyrion convinces the slavers to keep him alive until they can find a cock merchant. That's right, in the world of Game of Thrones, there are merchants that specialize in human cocks. In our world, those guys went away after the Dutch cock crash of 1637. Meanwhile, back in King's Landing, Lancel runs into Littlefinger. This is an odd scene as Lancel tells Littlefinger that the new King's Landing won't tolerate flesh peddling. However, last time they actually shut down Littlefinger's brothel, so really Littlefinger isn't doing anything wrong anymore. However, despite the fact that his brothel was shut down, he tells Lancel that he is in fact currently flesh peddling, and then insults the Faith of the Seven to boot. And in response, Lancel does nothing. I am not understanding the logic of the Sparrows. Now Littlefinger brings news to Cersei that Sansa is alive and well in Winterfell and is marrying Ramsay. I have no idea how Littlefinger is the first person to bring Cersei this information. No one in Winterfell or that inn brought this information to King's Landing? The entire North knows about this marriage. You'd think at least one of those maesters up there would send the information to the Citadel, who would then pass it on to Pycelle, who would then tell Cersei. The Lannisters must honestly have the worst intelligence network in the world. Littlefinger offers to rally the Vale in exchange for being named Warden of the North. Now, of course, I specifically remember a speech that Cersei gave Joffrey in Season 1 about how the North would never accept foreign rulers, but whatever. Meanwhile, down in Loras' birthmark, Tristan and Myrcella are in love. But Bronn Oakhart and Jaime Swan are coming to rescue Myrcella. And they sneak right into the castle doing the Wizard of Oz OEO trick. And in a very convenient coincidence, the Sand Snakes are trying to kidnap Myrcella at the exact same time. Hi, Jinx! This might as well be an episode of Three's Company. Is that too old of a reference? This might as well be an episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Is that still too old? This might as well be an episode of The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. By the way, is there any reason that the Sand Snakes are covering their face? Oh no, marcella has been kidnapped by three armed women with incredible breasts. Who could have done it? Anyway, Bronn knocks Tristan the fuck out, and then the Sand Snakes stupidly attack with the non-lethal weapon. Should have gone with the spear. Should have gone with the spear. And Bronn says what we're all thinking. For fuck's sake. It's actually pretty funny to watch Marcella during this fight scene. She goes from trying to wake Tristan up, to falling on her butt, to trying to wake him up again, to then getting distracted by the fight, and then falling on her butt again. She's spirited out of the fighting area, only to be magically teleported back into the fighting area. And by the way, everyone, I finally spotted a motherfucking lemon tree. And then we get... 
I am Obara Exposition Sand. Yeah, I know. I'm the captain of your family guard. Daughter of Oberyn Martell. Oh, I thought it was Oberyn Finkelstein. I fight for Dorne. Wait, we're not in Bravos? Then what's up with those fucking lemon trees? And then Bronn says that one of them fights really good for being a little girl, which causes her to hulk out. I guess that reminds her of middle school or some other emotionally sensitive time. Meanwhile, in King's Landing, the QOT makes it into town and tells Cersei that she's being completely illogical. I'm actually pretty surprised that a Tyrell army led by Sam's dad isn't already on its way. I guess she thinks that diplomacy still has a chance. Loras testifies that he's not gay, but Olivar comes in and says he is, and his proof is that he knows about Loris's birthmark. Now I have to say this is pretty weak evidence. Loris is highborn. This means that people dress him, they bathe him, everyone should know about his birthmark. It should be public knowledge. And as Loris' squire, wouldn't Olivar be responsible for putting on Loris's tacit and other armor near his crotch? Now I'm not sure why the Kingsguard begin to defend Marjorie and then hesitate and don't do it. Tommen gives no commands one way or the other. If Marjorie were under Kingsguard protection, they should have slaughtered the sparrows. If she were not, they should have stood in place. I guess they were expecting a slaughter command that never came. Up in Winterfell, Sansa wavers between being a strong, dark Sansa and the damsel in distress. Miranda tries to scare Sansa, and Sansa tells her to shut the fuck up, especially when you're in my house, and then cries right afterwards. Alfie Allen acts the hell out of these scenes. Not that he was bad in the first four seasons, but something happened. He's just upped his game. Sansa Poole gets married, though there's no lying in front of the heart tree, so I guess the gods won't be angry? Besides Fat Walda, I wonder who some of these people are. Risewells? Dustins? The people that empty the chamber pots? And finally, this scene. Ah. Uh, I mean, I guess I sort of saw this coming the minute I found out that Sansa and Jane Poole's characters were going to be merged but it again highlights how illogical Littlefinger's plans are. And I again don't know where they're going with the Sansa character. Are they trying to make her this dark, strong character, or are they making her a damsel in distress? Now, some people may say that HBO is just going for shock here, which of course they are, but at the same time, it's way toned down from what Jane Poole experienced in the book. This expression from Theon essentially sums the whole thing up. But realistically, considering that Theon has also been through the killing of children who may or may not be his own, and the cutting off of his own penis, I would say that this is down the list of horrible things that Theon has seen. Oh well, we'll see you next time in episode 7.